is uh, uh, to be here. Um, the, the question for the, this morning is a really, I think, a, a very interesting one. It's become even more interesting to me uh, in the last uh, few months. Uh, my colleague at, uh, uh, at Harvard, Paul Farmer, and I um, began teaching an anthropology course, but focused on global health. And of course, we started off with a history of uh, global health. And um, I thought I knew something about this, but learned some very interesting things. For example, uh, the first sanitary conference was in 1851. And um, uh, as Professor Siddiqui and others have written about this time, it was mostly focused on cholera and yellow fever. And uh, interestingly, uh, the, the conflict between science and politics was very evident even at that time. The English and the French, of course, wanted to, quote, relieve shipping from the burdensome shackles of quarantine regulations. Uh, Italy, Russia, Greece, Spain, and Portugal, with much smaller uh, maritime interests, argued that protecting their citizens from cholera was the utmost concern. Uh, it got so heated that for the second, for the second, third, fourth, and fifth conferences, all medical doctors were excluded and only diplomats could participate. Uh, in malaria, the intense argument about whether it was economic development and agriculture to lead to a lessening of malaria or whether DDT and other technical interventions to try to eradicate malaria thus path for economic development. The technological approach, of course, went out. We failed in mal malaria eradication, and this all happened in the context of the Cold War. Packard and others have written beautifully about this complicated situation. Smallpox, of course, there was the vertical, horizontal uh, argument. Uh, but interestingly, in terms of diplomacy, there was an open door between WHO and CDC. And I think that all of the great accomplishments in global health were when the, what happened, institutions and the American government cooperated as if they were one. Smallpox eradication wouldn't have happened if uh, CDC had not seconded literally hundreds of people to Geneva mm -hmm under the flag of the United Nations to eradicate smallpox. Uh, unfortunately, we have not had that kind of relationship over the last eight years. Around SARS, for example, um, uh, Mike Ryan, who is one of my heroes, who's, um, who runs this, the, uh, the pandemic flu response at WHO, said that when SARS happened, people who hated each other's guts, who came from completely different political persuasions, were on the phone every morning, uh, aggressively uh, uh, seeking out information and completely openly sharing data. Um, uh, Secretary Thompson actually was so interested in supporting WHO's work in um, pandemic flu that he gave $6 million to Dr. J.W. Lee, my former boss, and we built the shock center, the strategic operations center, which is state of the art. So it's possible to, um, uh, to, to have great diplomacy and to have effective relations, but I think that uh, leadership to determine which things we're going to cooperate on and how is critical. So the more direct question is, can science drive global health diplomacy in a positive way? Uh, we're in a, living in a very exciting time. There's going to be a new... Uh, and uh, in reading the various takes on what this, is, what this means, uh, one, uh, uh, one uh, columnist wrote that there are breaks that happen, and he uh, talked about uh, the Roosevelt uh, and um, uh, Kennedy, and also Ronald Reagan. Now, he, th this columnist also wrote that while things can be remade, it's not as if you get rid of all the things from the past. Some of you will remember that Sarah Palin quoted Ronald Reagan about the, uh, the worrisome uh, march of communism and socialism. Well, it turns out that, uh, that at that time, uh, Citizen Reagan uh, said that in a record that he made critiquing Medicare as a socialist uh, intervention. I have it, actually, on MP3 if you'd like to listen to it. It's very interesting. <laughs> But the point is that President Reagan, despite the break from the past and the start of, a new, of, a, of, a, of an era that has lasted for quite a long time, <clears throat> did not get rid of <laughs> Medicare, despite the fact that he thought it was the first step toward communism some time before. 
What is the legacy that we have as global health practitioners of this administration? I think it's a glorious one. I think PEPFAR uh, uh, was one of the most extraordinary and positive things that this country has ever done. It's certainly the largest public health project uh, ever started. But I congratulate uh, uh, President Bush. And thank you, Roger, for the very generous uh, introduction. But it was really President Bush who, uh, who fundamentally changed the perception in the world about whether or not the HIV treatment would be possible. And, and we must give him full credit. But the legacy of PEPFAR comes to us in a very difficult context. We have a lot of dichotomous, uh, heated arguments uh, that have led to ruptures in global health diplomacy, public health versus commercial interests that date back to 1851, protect our borders from disease versus protect the health of poor people in those countries, technical fixes as in malaria versus investing in things like economic and agricultural development, vertical disease focus because horizontal health system strengthening, and finally, AIDS versus everything else. You know, uh, I am a, am a hopelessly romantic believer in the power of science to help us do so many things better. Now, in 1993, the World Development Report, at sort of uh, a report that was written at the end of George Herbert Walker Bush's uh, tenure, at a time when the absolute uh, uh, hegemonic ideology was that structural adjustment and shrinking social sector spending was the only way that developing countries could lead could, could get on the path of development and in that context of shrinking social sector spending the new science that was uh, brought to us by people like Dean Jameson and Chris Murray was cost-effectiveness analysis in a context of shrinking expenditures, knowing exactly what you're getting for your health input was a great advance. And it did rationalize our approach to global health tremendously. But that was in the context of shrinking expenditures. Starting in 2000 and 2003, things that were not on the table before, HIV treatment, drug-resistant TB treatment, malaria uh, treatment and prevention, uh, all of these things were on the table. So what kind of science do we need now in order to the project forward and also, I would argue, to get us past some of uh, what others have called false dichotomies that plague um, our efforts at, at improving diplomacy. Discovery. I, you know, the Gates Foundation is, is in, and, and NIH is, is uh, investing in getting to the molecular level around things like malaria, uh, you know, the malaria uh, tuberculosis looking at new uh, potential drug markers, et cetera. This is critically important. It's been, it's been ignored for the neglected diseases, including tuberculosis, malaria, and the, and the wide range of the so-called neglected tropical diseases. And also, in development, the, the, the Gates Foundation has come up with a very nice 3D kind of approach, discovery, development, delivery. And they have invested a tremendous amount of money in both discovery and development, as has NIH. But I would argue that the real revolution and the way to improving diplomacy, the way to illuminating questions uh, that have plagued us and that we've really not taken on in the way that, that I would argue we should, is delivery. And this is not policy alone. This is getting at the level of how you actually put programs together. Let me give you an example. I had the great good fortune of visiting Jimmy, who I, I have to say was uh, by far the most effective ambassador in getting uh, the PEPFAR program implemented. But in, in Uganda, there were two programs that I visited, TASO, the, the AIDS service organization, a community-based organization, and JCRC, run by Peter Mugenyi, uh, uh, as a researcher. The TASO programs funded by PEPFAR looked like TASO programs. Mm -hmm. They had community health workers, motorcyclists going out, they had singing groups, they had support groups. It, was, it looked like who they were, and it was very effective, but only a couple thousand people in treatment. Peter Mugenyi, on the other hand, was a laboratorian. He has done miracles in, in building out laboratory infrastructure in Uganda, but he basically wrote prescriptions and didn't have all this um, uh, 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 infrastructure to follow up the patients. Some 20,000 people in treatment, but we don't really know what's happening with them. Uh, there's other programs, Ampath in Kenya, Ciders in Zambia, and, and what we have done at Harvard is we've taken a lesson from our business school and engineering colleagues and tried to write case studies to figure out what they're actually doing and what their system design is and connect it to outcomes. And what we the system designs are completely different. And if you ask, well, what was the foundation upon which you built that particular system design? It often has to do with the history of that organization, the personality of the individuals, and this is not science-driven. 
Now, when I presented this problem of an explosion of funding, an explosion of delivery models to my colleagues at Harvard Business School and my colleagues at the MIT uh, Department of Systems um, uh, Engineering, they couldn't believe that these huge expenditures time reaching the poorest of the poor in these countries were being built as badly as we've built the US healthcare system. <laughs> in the US healthcare system, there's been the ideology that if you get the science right and you build the tools, the rest will fall into place. Uh, Dr. Zuhuni talked a lot has talked a lot about get a translational block. And that's what we need to do. And I think that's the new science that still needs to be built. And I just am so grateful to Roger for, uh, for championing this idea of building a science of implementation and delivery. What's it going to look like? Well, I think that in addition to basic science, clinical science, epidemiology, evaluation science, policy studies, we need the systems engineers, business strategists, management sciences, the operations research that does wonders to uh, rationalize the final four brackets, but has not been brought to bear when we're spending billions of dollars on building HIV treatment programs in developing countries. Uh, we've, had a, we've had a fantastic experience at Harvard with our colleagues writing cases just at this, what we would call the observational stage of the science, just figuring out what people are doing. And in every case, we found things about the way that, that different organizations have done things. BRAC in Bangladesh, uh, the polio eradication program in Uttar Pradesh, the TB uh, 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 is fantastically well developed in Peru. Every single time we looked carefully with the eyes of systems engineers and business and management operations specialists, that we didn't expect, and we also found problems that were easily fixable that they weren't aware of at the project site. So I would argue that uh, this is not a problem just to the developing world. Uh, there's going to be a conference in, on January 29th that Brian Mittman and his colleagues that are looking at the question of scaling up. You know, whoever, President Obama, if he lasts for eight years, is going to face a health care budget that's going to be double what it is today. The projections are that by 2017, the health care budget will be $4.2 trillion. He has no choice but to try to get our health care system moving in a direction where we lower costs and improve quality. The great news is that at the business school and at the and engineering schools, they've actually identified uh, systems like Intermountain Healthcare and Theta Care and parts of the Kaiser system that have already reduced expenditures by almost half with improved quality. Can we do that for the whole system? I, I think that that's an absolute necessity. And I think that the notion that healthcare in the United States is about science and, and global health is about what? Is about sort of, you know, um, uh, individuals getting off and doing their moral duty. I think it's a unified, uh, and uh, a, 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 at least a, a field, and that we have to turn it into a science. Let me just end by saying this. There will be a lot of people who say that in the current economic climate, we can't afford to invest in global health. We can't afford in doubling the NIH budget, as President-elect Obama has, uh, has, has promised. But I would argue that global health, as Colin Powell and others have said, is a moral imperative. We have to invest in global health out of self-interest to make sure that we can stop pandemic flu. It's an issue of national security, and it's a way to remake our relationship with the rest of the world. Investing in science is the only way, I would argue, that we can ensure our future competitiveness. So if people in this government say to you, those things that you talk about are nice ideas, but can we possibly afford investing in global health and science in this economic period? And I think all, I hope all of us in this room will answer with a simple response, yes, we can. <laughs> 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 Jim, that was an inspiring start for this uh, this session. And let me have Jimmy uh, come back and, and, and drag us through the point of view of Uganda <laughs> and UNICEF. Thank you. Thanks very much. I think the question you posed in the introductions is the right one. Why am I here? Uh, uh -huh. How did I become a health diplomat? And Jim gave part of the answer that in 2003, when President Bush announced the emergency plan for AIDS relief, I was ambassador to Uganda. And it uh, I have no, through no merit or virtue of mine, I became head of the largest AIDS program in the world. And this was very decentralized. The, the 
ambassadors and country teams were responsible for setting budget, picking partners, setting priorities, and then being accountable for, for the results. And watch out what you wish for, because this is what uh, diplomats had wanted from Washington for many, many years. But suddenly it was a, upon us. And the some of the questions were, how do you make AIDS a priority? It was certainly a priority in Uganda, but it wasn't necessarily a priority in the U.S. government or U.S. mission. It wasn't necessarily a priority among the partners beyond our normal partners. And we were students. Where does it fit in with everything else we're doing? It was 80% of our budget in Uganda turned out to be an AIDS program. It made, certainly caught the ambassador's attention, but of course that wasn't the only thing that the only interest the U.S. had in the country. What are the political constraints? What are, who are the appropriate partners? Who pays for what? Will this reinforce or subvert other equities? How do you deal with high transaction costs? Um, I have to say, sometimes universities and research programs are some of the most labor intensive that an embassy has to, to administer, and I'll come back to that. So in Uganda in 2003, it was not a question, I think we knew what to do. It's a question of how, how do you do it and how do you get the public policy part of this right? And because of um, having been intrigued by that, and because I think we did have some good results in Uganda, um, when I left there, I didn't go right to UNICEF. I actually spent two years as a deputy global AIDS coordinator in, in mm -hmm. Office of the Global AIDS Coordinator here in Washington, and then moved on and, and have now reinvented myself as an international civil servant. This is hardly what I imagined when I first came into the Foreign Service. Henry Kissinger was Secretary of State. I think we really did have the idea that the role of diplomats was sharing secrets or trying to uncover secrets of other governments. And I learned a little bit more as a diplomat that, in fact, what you do in embassies uh, quite a bit is to find out what's going on in Uganda or whatever it is, whatever country you're posted, what's going on in Uganda and what does it mean for the United States? How do we maximize areas of agreement and convergence and minimize areas of disagreement and divergence? And that that was a fairly defined universe for quite a while, but the communication and transportation revolution really did change change the terms and change the players. And it's not just that the internet and fax and cell phones made the communication more instantaneous. It's that really almost everything is now in the public domain. There's 24-hour news television. And it, if there were, for instance, a cholera outbreak in, say, Uganda or a strike at a textile plant, there'd be kind of a race it wasn't Phyllis who would call first to find out if I was okay, or the White House Situation Room, or the Pentagon, or Senator Luger's office, or CDC. All of these people were watching the same news programs and the same kind of instantaneous desk officer response of what are we going to do about this? And so the question of what's happening in Uganda and what does it mean to the United States became a matter not of thoughtful analysis, but um, sometimes responding in the same news cycle. And those, the people who called might also not uh, be Global Action for Children or Bono, who also were stakeholders in what was going on in, in Uganda. And one consequence of this is that the State Department became less the center of foreign relations than it had ever been before. Everyone had interests around the globe, and everyone was able to react immediately to have their partners abroad as well as the embassy, respond almost instantaneously to their interests. And so an ambassador visiting Washington wouldn't just check in with the State Department or USAID and maybe the Defense Department, but needed to go to HHS and Interior and the Drug Czar and a, a dozen other agencies in order to do his or her job in representing U.S. interests abroad. Now, in, in UNICEF, I was just in India for the past week, and, and there question of science is is very important, but it's certainly not, it's a necessary but not a sufficient condition to scale up, for instance, in prevention of mother-child transmission, early infant diagnosis. Um, the science is very clear that triple therapy is a more efficacious regimen for pregnant women who are HIV positive to prevent transmission of the virus to their children. Um, however, India is using single-dose nevirapine, which is um, a less effective regimen. There's no doubt, no one in India even doubts that the science uh, would recommend that, but in fact, they're not making the change. Same on early infant diagnosis. A fantastic study in South Africa shows that um, if you start treatment within the first year of life, 
the survival rate for infants who are infected with HIV, um, even without any symptom or any CD4 count that would justify it, survival rate is, uh, improves by 75%. There are, there are techniques for early infant diagnosis. They're known in India. They're available in the technology that's happening there, but it's not happening. And I mean, in a week you can hardly scratch the surface of knowing the very complex factors that make that happen. But it's certainly true that even the public sector only provides about a quarter of the, uh, only about a quarter of births are even in public sector. Another third are in private sector facilities, and about half the women don't give birth in supervised uh, in institutional uh, facilities at all. And trying to move not only the policy but the practice and the num and the stakeholders, and then the idea that someone coming from UNICEF in New York with the science, that isn't the Indian solution. The Indian solution is going to be to do something that they feel is the right place and time for them. And so diplomats and I think UN officials have always used evidence. This isn't, science isn't something new, and Jim had some wonderful examples. Certainly, the, when I served in Europe during the Cold War, the range of missiles was important. You, people even as um, uh, amateur as I could talk about which missiles could reach which, which targets and what the effect might be. Um, we certainly um, genetically modified crops, and as U.S. exports, it was a huge issue between the U.S. and a number of to know the science of genetic modification and what that might mean in the food chain and so on. Need the need for local approval of U.S.-made drugs, very direct health um, intervention that U.S. embassies have been responsible for for, for years. And then the U.S. was in the lead for many years in population and family planning based on a lot of data and evidence about the effectiveness and the uh, threats to, of, of not dealing with population questions. We have uh, science attaches and a few health attaches, and I see some in the audience around the world. And we are, um, the, the diplomats have always been aware of science. But the fact that there's lots of science and there's lots of economic data, I guess I love this kind of work because it seemed to me that the gap was in the public policy side. These questions before, how do you make this a priority? Where does it fit in with everything else? What are the political constraints? Who are appropriate partners? Who pays? What does this do to other equities we have? And then at home, these are questions that politicians and the federal government address. And overseas, it's diplomats who look out for U.S. and taxpayers and questions. We try to see the big picture. And there's also culture of embassies in the State Department, which also I think in this audience it's fair to say that having CDC suddenly become a global agency, PEPFAR turned CDC into a program management and implementing agency, disease response uh, mechanism, and there were Beth Schlachter's in the audience, and she was the human resources officer in, in Uganda, now also moved to public health diplomacy. But, I mean, those motorcycle extension workers that you were talking about from Tasso, they were actually CDC employees. She had to do the, all this. this why, and you get the question, why does CDC have 484 employees in Uganda? The, these are all difficult questions that are outside of the sort of State Department and diplomatic culture, very difficult to deal with and digest. And, you know, we're going to buy a $200,000 refrigeration system for a laboratory. Well, that, you know, that's not on the list of things the State Department can buy. You have to go through all sorts of contract approvals that are very difficult when it's self-evident that these are things that have a public health value and, and make sense from a scientific point of view. So Fogarty, I'm pleased to say, has a low footprint in terms of administrative support. So uh, we can celebrate that measure. Um, when, I, when I meet young people, they're almost all interested in international careers. And I think that's absolutely commendable, and I urge them, and I've loved mine. But that's a little bit different than diplomacy. Diplomats work in offices and work in a hierarchy. They go to other people's meetings. They clear documents written by somebody else. If you're good, you stay in touch with the grassroots, but that's not actually where you work. And you can say that, if again, if you're good, you have the big picture, you can be an integrator, but you're not an implementer. You don't get to see patients or people who are beneficiaries of your programs except on a kind of ceremonial visit where you uh, drive in. 
And this is a kind of irony about diplomacy when we talk about global health diplomacy or anything else, that um, it, it, when your first sanitation conference took place, there were really no qualifications. Almost anyone could be a doctor or a dentist or a lawyer or a clergyman or a military or a teacher or architect or a diplomat. And little by little, especially after the Civil War in the U.S., there became a credentialing process for all these people. And we were at a law school. There's specific degrees, and with due respect to Georgetown School of Foreign Service, there aren't any for the you don't need a degree in order to join the Foreign Service. There are also professional licensing requirements. Even hairdressers need to be licensed to do business. You need, there are associations which set performance standards and say that some people actually have violated the rules of the profession. Diplomats don't have any of these things. Um, that doesn't mean, though, that everyone is qualified to be a diplomat, at least in my selfish view. Um, as a diplomat, I've been very privileged to find a niche in public health. And I hope that the emphasis on public health diplomacy helps health professionals and lawyers find the right niche and the constructive niche in the profession of diplomacy. Thanks very much. Jimmy, we'll give you a degree in public health after <laughs> that experience. And finally, Dr. Ilya Zerhouni. Thank you. Well, first of all, happy birthday to Forward International, 40 years of great, great leadership. And I was uh, just re reminiscing because I was in Wisconsin um, a few weeks ago celebrating Melvin Laird uh, opening a research uh, building at the Fair Marshfield Clinic. And he was telling me how he and John Fogarty and Lister Hill, in a period of about 10 years, um, working in Congress, um, multiply the budget of NIH by 18 times, mm -hmm. the good old days. <laughs> and I think that, that the John Fogarty Center uh, was created because after he died, people realized that he's had. He was a bricklayer, poor worker, uh, ran from Congress and became one of the most powerful members of Congress. Uh, and uh, basically never forgot that he, the humanitarian instinct, the moral imperative of health, and he wanted to do this. And as, as a tribute to him, they created the Fogarty Center to do just that. I also want to congratulate Georgetown University to talk about the, the nexus of diplomacy and global health and really uh, try to understand how that uh, works. It's clear that uh, we're, we're, you've heard it. Uh, we have imperatives here that are moral, humanitarian, but are also security and economic imperatives. And yet the development of health diplomacy per se is still lagging uh, behind as other imperatives too often dominate the priority list of world leaders. So I was, I was, I was preparing for this. And you know, when you are uh, heading a complex organization, you have many, many facts that come your way. And you learn from many different angles and different techniques, different projects, different programs. And Roger said I did travel quite a bit. So what I would like to do today is really not give you a, a, a whole um, spectrum of possible, possible points of discussion, but I'll just like to focus on one that I have come to the conclusion is probably one of the main levers that will uh, make, ha help us make progress in this field. Now, um, spending in, in global health has gone from about $2 billion a year to $12 billion a year, in great part because of the PEPFAR program, the Global a uh, Fund uh, for AIDS, and also, also the commitment of many countries and many foundations. There is a movement in place, and I see that movement at NIH as well. There is an enormous resurgence of enthusiasm and interest in the young generations of students and scientists towards global health issues. Uh, during my tenure at NIH, uh, we did put a greater focus on global health, and that has led to a tripling of international research grants from about $200 million a year in 2002 to about $700 million a year. So that's not counting all of the investments we make in the molecular biology, the fundamental mechanisms of AIDS and TB and malaria and all of the other diseases, including the rising threats of chronic diseases in many uh, developing countries. But what I'd like to share with you is my personal sense of, of what I have observed that may or may, may be important to focus on to be able to do what I think Jimmy and, and Jim talked about. 
And I, as I looked at the numerous NIH activities in global health and their successes and failure, I've, I've really learned a, a few lessons that I'd like to share. First, when I look at the legacy of 40 years of investments in global health through the Fogarty International Center, there's no doubt that the fundamental legacy are the 4,000 international scientists who have been trained through FIC programs. And I think Roger mentioned it in the last 20 years, uh, we have developed a cadre of leaders. And if you go around the world, you will almost always find an FIC alumnus in charge of a major program, whether it be Haiti with John Pop and and they have characteristics that I've tried to list and see what is it that makes a program work. And what you find is that they typically combine research, local applications of that research, and the training of local talent to study and understand not only the science, but also the effectiveness of given measures in given populations. Without permanent local capacity, tuned to the local culture and behaviors of the population and its environment, the programs of intervention that I have uh, overseen are like almost like a condition of success is to have these characteristics. The more, most vibrant programs actually also play a role in policy development and in advising policymakers and, in fact, directing the diplomacy of their own country. And uh, in my um, uh, experience, this, this local capacity, which is networked to the rest of the world, is a key component of how global diplomacy, global health diplomacy has to, to um, the direction has to go into. Now, with the rapid influxes of resources we've seen over the past uh, few years, uh, it's clear that we're taking often resources away from local priorities to priorities that are driven by the donors or providers of the interventions, which are likely to leave a, uh, not likely to leave a sustainable human infrastructure capable of addressing uh, in an independent fashion, autonomous fashion, the health problems faced by the, popul by the population. So. The main point I'm trying to make is that, in my opinion, a core strategic issue is how to develop sufficient and qualified local human capacity who can understand and practice the science needed to train and deploy effective and smart interventions, and more importantly, who can become real partners at the table of health diplomacy. Um, my experience throughout the world is that there is a direct correlation between the success of scientifically strong programs and the participation of a given country in the concert of global health diplomacy. It's amazing. Um, I've had instances where I had to deal with polio issues in, in, in Afghanistan and in, in Pakistan, Nigeria, India, AIDS issues in, in South Africa. And every time things worked, it's because you had people who had been networked before through a scientific interactions through the scientific process, regardless of what the content of their science was, who were able to bridge the gap. The SARS crisis is an example. When we work with, uh, with China, it was very key that around that new Minister of Health, there were 12, half of whom had been FIC uh, trained, who knew about the rest of the world and, and were competent to, to, to lead that effort. Now, let's remember that in my, from my point of view, Diplomacy is a negotiation activity, and good negotiations requires, requires certain symmetry, a symmetry of knowledge, a symmetry of education, of values and goals. If not, distrust and diplomatic failure will ensue. So whenever I was involved, it turned out, in my experience, that the success of hold, held diplomacy often hinged on the presence of these well-trained and qualified scientific and health leaders and advisors to the policymakers of their country. And many of, the, of these were trained through scientific programs at international institutions like the NIH. It obviously, uh, it's clear that having that resource is a fundamental component of global health diplomacy when you look on the ground at what happens really in terms of success. And I think without that, it's very hard for me to see how you build effective diplomacy, uh, which requires a certain level of understanding and trust that could not be achieved otherwise. On the other hand, once you've, if you believe this point, as a, let's just take it on faith, then the other problem that I see is the problem of what I call the problem of scale. So when you look at the issues of scale uh, about 
how do you create this capacity uh, worldwide that can be networked, that can interact in a way that creates synergy, uh, you have to realize that we are not at scale. I mean, we're spending $12 billion, great, six times more than the $2 billion. But we spend about $300 billion on agricultural subsidies that have a direct impact and probably generate more than $12 billion of lost economic opportunity in the same countries we're trying to intervene in. There is somewhat of an irrationality that I think we need to tackle in terms of scale and impact. So you know, in, in, from, I'm sure I share my own opinion here. I'm the former director. I'm, I can speak freely. <laughs> You know, uh, when, you are, when you take a high-level position, you know, you lose two rights. The First Amendment right, which is the right of free speech, and the 28th Amendment right, which is the right to free lunches. <laughs> <laughs> and then when you leave, then you regain those two rights. <laughs> so, um, so globally, when you look at the world population that has increased over six billions, one is struck by the disproportion between the scale of our efforts and the sheer size of the problem facing us. While it's true that at no time in history we've, we, have we seen so many hundreds of millions rise out of poverty and reach functional educational levels, you heard about Bangladesh, we experienced a world where over 3.7 billion people live with less than $2 a day. And this is more than the total world population less than 50 years ago. This means that our current funding for global health amounts to less than $4 per year um, for the individuals that we're really targeting in terms of intervention. The sheer disproportion between resources and needs uh, require us to really look at the that they're leveraged maximally and that we uh, certainly um, can develop the resources that are, that, that are needed in this effort. So simply said, we're not, quote unquote, at scale. So when, when I hear Jim, I really resonate with his uh, systems analysis concept. I'm trained as a bioengineer, medical engineer, and I like this sort of approach. But the scale issue is, is also fundamentally something that's facing us. So when you look at the total knowledge that we've accumulated through NIH and many other institutions, that total knowledge fund has increased and our means of interventions are greater. The amount of resources per capita, though, have decreased because of the demographic pre pressure. But more importantly, I think the knowledge per capita, which is a main driver of public health success, is increased as well. Um, if you don't have a common fund of health literacy about the causes and effect of poor health, Interventions become less and less effective. It's, it's, it's proven, it's, it's shown. So without a minimal but qualified scientific capacity, the brain trust needed for understanding the local drivers of health and participate in global health diplomacy cannot exist. Hmm. So let me just draw my f conclusion, and that is that there cannot be global health diplomacy without addressing the fundamental question of how to build sufficient local and competent human capacity to serve as the bedrock of effective interventions and policy making with maximum efficiency. Just like you cannot think of global commerce without trained bankers and, and business networks using common standards and terms of exchange, there cannot be global health diplomacy without a sufficient network of trained and interactive public health scientists. So let me just give you an estimate which I came up with last night. I was writing my notes, but trust me, it's not far from what were the truth. If you just simply estimated that you needed at least one world-class, connected, qualified, trained public health scientist per hundred thousand individuals, you know, one ten per million, and um, and if you said, well, I want to develop that sort of network framework infrastructure for the part of the world that we are concerned about in global health, the number that you would need would be 37,000. Mm -hmm. NIH funds in the U.S. about 40,000 main scientists, PIs, with associated scientists, the total is 300,000. So if you look at 37,000, then you look at 20 years of efforts at FIC with 4,000 people trained, you realize that we are basically 
a 10 to, at a 10 to 1 deficit in our capacity, worldwide capacity, to train the people at a very minimum level that will guarantee that we can have effective global health diplomacy. So the solution to the scale of problem will require innovative approaches and long-term support, in my view, of a global research, global network of research and training centers of excellence in the developing world in association with local institutions and using a common curriculum, modern methods of education, as well as a standardized approach to the building of scientific capacity. Topics that uh, G Jim was talking about, policy development expertise, logistics and operations research, implementation research methods, which is a topic very near and dear to Roger, and law and ethics. How to fund and sustain such an enterprise a daunting problem? I don't have a ready answer, but I believe that the WHO declaration that is being prepared for Bamako, where there's a clause that I find important, and that is a clause that calls that for 5% of all donor programs to be dedicated to the development of health research capacity and its applications. Without that, I don't know how you can scale up to the 10 to 1 um, uh, ratio that I think is, is critical. Now, most program leaders, when you say that to them, they think of science as molecular biology and microscopes. They don't look at implementation science. It's going to take away from my $4 per person, mm -hmm. and I have the, the vaccines to deliver, and what is this? And the transaction cost, as Jimmy knows, when you are coming in with airplanes and helicopters and, and uh, international travel to deliver that is higher than what it would be if you had local capacity to deliver it. So I understand that. But in some ways, it's being short-term wise and long-term foolish. Because at the end of the day, this is what will change the, the landscape. And progress will require that this capacity problem be addressed. Now, I see Nina Fedorov here, and she organized actually a very good workshop at the state in terms of uh, combining universities in the developing world. And here, I have to say that I, as I visit universities in the developing world where I come from, I've seen a degradation, not an improvement, uh, of, uh, of, of, of capacity building, capacity of building capacity. Uh, throughout the world. I mean, you have universities that had 5,000 students and good programs, now with 50,000 students and no programs. And you're not going to be able to do this by relying on these, um, on these uh, existing resources today. You have to have a smarter, um, more innovative approach that is networked globally and connected. And at the end of the day, I, c I could have talked to you about all the great progress we've made and science and this approach to science, but my conclusion is that it is the process of global science development, not its specific content, that is the real glue uh, for effective global health diplomacy. Thank you. Well, thank you. As you can see what, a, what visionary ideas we have here. and. Um, uh, really challenging us to think of how to scale up and how to implement and how to uh, move this agenda ahead. Let me begin with questions and open this discussion. We have about 20 minutes for questions, and I see the first hand over there, Sally Benatar. Please introduce, stand up and introduce yourself and where you're from. Congratulations on your 40th birthday. I'm from the University of Cape Town. I have a Fogarty International Sponsored Center in Capacity Building and International Research Ethics, for which I'm, I'm most grateful. Uh, I'm also now intimately linked with the University of Toronto, where I work in the School of Public Health. I'd like to tap into Dr. Zahuni's talk for a moment, if I may. Global health has been an interest of mine for over 15 years, and I uh, sympathize with many of the points he's made, but I want to emphasize a couple. There's no, prob there's no point at all in thinking we can impact on global health unless we understand how the global economy operates. If we don't understand about those uh, sub subsidies to agriculture in the United States and Europe and the fact that they result in about 50 billion or more loss of earnings for developing countries, we won't begin to understand what that's about. 
We need to understand trade rules in their enormity and the way those have been locked into place through the uh, Washington consensus and the new constitutionalism over the last 10 or 15 years, which absolutely will ensure that the rich will remain rich and the poor will remain poor. Unless we understand that, unless we have the vision to understand that global health is what the challenge is for the 21st century, that this 12 billion in the global fund is just a piddling drop in the ocean which will go nowhere. So the mindset shift that's required is absolutely enormous. We also have to begin to understand what the impact of the arms trade is on health. Many people don't know that many donor countries, foreign international aid given to developing countries, much of that money is taken back to the donor countries through the purchase of weapons, which is linked to the aid. So the, aids, the, the arms trade needs to be understood. We can find vast sums of money to make war, but we can't find even small amounts of money to make peace. This, again, is the new challenge of, of your new president in America and the challenge for the world in the 21st century. If you look at the resources uh, to bail out the failed banks, it's vast in comparison to the resources that are needed to expand the scientific endeavor and to expand the uh, attention to the social determinants of health. And so here are wonderful opportunities for, for us to grapple with and to link into for the future. And I really hope that we've got the kind of imagination that's necessary to do so, because unless we are thinking 40 or 50 years into the future, both for ourselves and for everybody else, I'm afraid that the trajectory of human progress at the moment, uh, climate-wise, environment and everything else, is seriously adverse for everybody. The impact on health of the recent financial crash is so vast in developing countries that any progress in science made over the last 50 years has almost been wiped out in a couple of days because of that. And so we need to understand, we need to perceive the problem, we have to understand that, uh, that, that, that we're facing. And the global economy needs to be trimmed in some way. To but the understanding of how appropriate international taxation can operate, um, the, 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 the tax breaks and the tax havens that many international companies use to avoid tax could generate some of the resources required for global health. And I really do hope that this powerful group of people and this endeavor will tap into many of those upstream issues. Thank you. <laughs> you, 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 you sound like a redistributionist, Sally. <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think it's, accumulating. I, you know, I don't think that's redistribution. I think it's fairness because if you spend three hundred billion dollars in protecting your own farmers, which really remove the ability of developing world farmers to sustain themselves, and then you come in the back end and say, "Well, I'm going to give you the medication four dollars per person per year uh, to correct for your inability to maintain sanitary conditions," that is redistribution. It's really an issue of spending the money where it needs to be spent and not spending the money in sustaining the past at the expense of the future. Mm -hmm. You're here. See, I'm free now. I can You're talk. here. <laughs> <laughs> We're lined up. Introduce yourself as you speak. Sense or whether it needs to be discreet. Sure. I, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of a bottom-up person, and I think one of the uh, real accomplishments of PEPFAR, and whether just uh, kind of good luck, was that we didn't wait for everything to before starting people on treatment, for instance. I know that there are probably people in the audience who would have said in the 15-year longitudinal study of how the resistance is going to work and how people react to drugs and so on, and it wasn't going to happen. So uh, there was a, the sense that if, if you... I, I agree, everything's related to everything else. And the democracy you named, and we have um, arms trade, food subsidies, 
climate change and uh, international taxation that Dr. Benatar mentioned. All these things are important, and yes, all of them impinge on everything else. But I think I think we would be making a mistake both as a country and I think in an individual program if you say I'm going to wait for all these other things to work out and we have to solve them, we have to have all those people at the table before we can move on a public health question. I think the one advantage of public health is that you can measure results and you can see an impact and you can judge whether you're having some impact. And then one of the, I think, um, good factors of PEPFAR is that it has matured, that the program, originally it was prevention, care, and treatment, 2 7 10 24 7. And that was what we were doing. That everyone, everyone in this room said, oh, but you have to think about nutrition, you have to think about violence against women, you have to think about income generating activities for people on treatment, so on, and, and everyone was right, and the and the health, certainly health manpower that your organization has been very active on. This isn't going to work unless we're able to train and reward uh, health resources, human resources. But in fact, it worked. And it, as the program matured, PEPFAR had the advantage, and I think that the UN system is doing this now too, of listening to our customers. That suddenly if there are two million people on treatment that for whom the U.S. government is in one way or another responsible, their needs for nutrition and for income generating activities and for uh, family planning and for all these other things speak to us. And a priori, it would have been very hard to have divided the money between those various priorities. But as the program develops and the our partners and the people we're trying to help speak for themselves and say this is what we need next, these are our priorities, we're able to make some of those linkages that are, would have been very hard to make if we'd waited for them or tried to decide in advance what were the most important linkages and how would we do that in each country. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm not as discouraged I, and, and in fact, civil society, one of the, the Global Fund, which is an a institution which, again, was set up in a way that I think no one would have invented if you were the most um, the cleverest manager of a business process. But it has, by empowering civil society and having this new structure of country coordinating mechanisms where civil society, people living with the diseases, have to be represented. Civil society itself has taken that on. The health minister of Botswana said the Global Fund has taught us about uh, democracy because we have to listen to a lot more people when we're doing a Global Fund grant proposal than we do for others. And, and so I, some of these things, fortunately public health can be a, a I, uh, can be a driver of this. These can be AIDS-driven, but not AIDS-exclusive interventions. And these secondary benefits need to be in our minds as we launch the programs. We don't have to wait to know all along. Let me take a little different. First of all, I think uh, Dr. Zuni's notion that there's a, there that that there are conditions that we have to meet before we can get to diplomacy, like basic needs. I think that's a stunningly brilliant uh, insight. And I also would say that. Um, you know, you know this well, Len. That that um, if you look at the tremendous advances that we've been made, that have been made around HIV, I think it's because of undiplomatic interventions that we've gotten there. You know? so so I think diplomacy is terribly important. But I think the two points that I'm taking out of this are that you know we we have to talk seriously about well, what would it require in terms of capacity funding. Uh, that that the poorest countries can actually participate in diplomacy on some sort of fair grounding. I think that's a that's a critical question. But I think that if AIDS teaches us anything, it's the fact that we still have these crazy activists like Greg Gonzalez and Mark Harrington will take off their clothes and embarrass people. I think that it was the interaction between those very undiplomatic people and people like Tony Fauci at NIH that led to the research, the drugs, and then led to the wide availability of those drugs, not only in the United States, but everywhere else. So, uh, um, you know, diplomacy will always go on. I, I've sat in endless number of, of uh, meetings where if you walk outside during coffee, they'll say that, nasty, blah, 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 and they walk inside and say, well, we're very grateful for the uh, intervention of the money. <laughs> You know, uh, so so uh, in the midst of those kind of very polite meetings, the undiplomatic um, intensity and passion of AIDS activists, I think, took us to a totally different place, and we shouldn't lose that as well, which is why um, I worry if there's anything that we do now in global health that doesn't include civil society in those voices. <clears throat> Wonderful responses. Next. Uh, yes, I'm Sharon landisman Ramey. Uh, a student and admirer of Fogarty, a former past board member, and I direct a center on health and education here at Georgetown University. 
and I study implementation science. Mm -hmm. I'd like to point out that a a crucial uh, leveraging opportunity is to coordinate some of our global health initiatives with education initiatives. Uh, Dr. Zahuni talked about a knowledge per capita. Although waiting for children to grow up takes a long time, education isn't focused solely on children. We have international develop gifted and talented throughout the world. Those are rarely coordinated with any of our health international and global activities. And so I'd like us to think about that if we're going to create almost sort of the equivalent of like what we had years ago with our U.S. Agricultural Extension Service taking modern discoveries quickly to farmers and home home gardeners. We need to create that both within the U.S. and internationally, and so I'd like to to, uh, hopefully encourage the connection with education. Thank you. Let me just say, I think that's a great, I, you know, as you can tell from my appearance, I grew up in Iowa, uh, and I was, uh, I was, I was, very, St. Louis. Yeah, I was very aware of ag extension, um, and, and what they really did was it was implementation support, yes, was. and I think that's precisely the kind of professionalism we need. And I have to say, I think we've got to look at the Foreign Assistance Act all over again. You know, this notion that, uh, you know, 1961, we were still saying the most important thing is to make sure money comes back to American contractors, as opposed to turning what we do into a professional science-based activity. So I think that's the challenge for this next generation. Can we do that? Can we look at those lessons like agricultural extension and and turn implementation into a professional activity? I think that's a great way to improve our relationship all over the world. And visibility. Next, Tom. My name is Tom Novotny. I'm uh, currently a professor at UC San Francisco, but I was uh, formerly a Deputy Assistant Secretary for International Refugee Health in HHS. And like uh, Dr. Zahuni, uh, stepped out of government into possibly back into academia. And by the way, free lunch is still hard to get because you can't pay for it on your NIH grants, so be prepared. Um, but my, my comment is directed to Ambassador Kolker, and I, I wonder if uh, you could perhaps comment on an idea that was brought forward by the Institute of Medicine uh, on uh, Healers Abroad, which was a book that they published uh, talking about a global health core. Uh, as a, as a professor now, as a teacher, the, in, the interest in our students across the country is just enormous for both public service, science, uh, rectifying health inequities, and there's not enough opportunity for people coming out of our health professions to do that in, in terms of global health. And it seemed like it was a pretty good idea to be able to mobilize a, something like a Peace Corps for health mm-hmm. that if you look back on the Peace Corps, and I was a Peace Corps volunteer, it was one of the better investments, I think, that our government ever made in terms of health, in terms of diplomacy. And so we have this possibility now, because I believe uh, President-elect Obama is very supportive of public service and further development of that. And whether this could be a way of partnering, of developing on the ground the mm-hmm. capacity of people through partnerships, exchanges, and also... Uh, Encouraging uh, our health professionals to come back into public service, where it's no longer the, uh, the sort of adversarial environment that we've had over the last eight years, uh, to to be able to exercise this uh, newfound energy that's really uh, amazingly evident now. So I wonder if you could just comment on whether or not that's a good idea. You mentioned CDC has become a global health agency. There's been a lot more employees in the field. Uh, I know it's expensive, but, you know, when we spend 10 billion bucks a month on war, could we not take 0.1% of that and do something better? No, they, they sent me some articles in preparation for this, and one of these you wrote and talked about that and correctly pointed out that this was the one aspect of the original authorization for PEPFAR that has not been implemented. And I'll tell you why. Uh, Randy Tobias, the day after he was confirmed, left for a trip and then met with all the ambassadors to the countries where the focus countries for PEPFAR. And the only thing we didn't like about the proposal was this idea for a health service corps. Not for all the reasons you say it's a terrific idea and it would be of benefit to the people involved, it would be of benefit to the United States, and we probably should try to make it happen. But when I talked about transaction costs to the U.S. government of providing a new kind of Peace Corps was so it was remarkable that you had a, a cry from the ambassadors to say, don't inflict this on us at the same time. And, and I'll tell you why. Even the Peace Corps can't actually practice medicine or treat patients in any way. 
And I realize that this, there are many people who don't want to do that, but much of the motivation is that people do want to do that. And the liability issues, the questions of how does this, does this replace local talent, the brain drain questions that are involved, what, what are we doing to are, in fact, very difficult diplomatic questions to, to try to resolve. And I think we need to look at ways to do this, but the idealism which motivates it isn't enough in itself to make this a feasible program. And I, I look forward to working with you and others to try to make it that. Senator Frist was all for this. It's had, it has lots of powerful sponsors. It's a wonderful idea. There would be a huge sign up to, to try to participate in it. But I think that some of the practical questions have made it up to now in the too hard box. So let's see if we can move it into a different box. Tom, you're writing about this and your advocacy has been great for us and a source of great encouragement for young people. But I would argue that there's nothing about medical or even public health education that prepares young people in the United States to be helpful on the ground over there. So let me just tell me. Yeah. So, so. Um, uh, and, and, it, and again, it's a blind spot. We've, it's, it's, the, it's the ignoring of the second translational block, again, that Dr. Zuni's talked so much about. And, and, and you know, so what we've tried to do is teach delivery at the medical school. How do you do that? What are the skills that you need? And they're completely different than the ones you're normally taught. Right. So I think, the, I think the burden on us is to make sure that if we send people over, that they have skills. Let me just say, education at Harvard Medical School, the newly appointed dean. And I gave him the data that after Michael Porter of Harvard Business School came to talk to the students about how he thinks about health care, a quarter of our first year class decided they wanted to get an MBA. The, 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 the dean and, and the dean of education, and they know that they can't make any money out there now, right? So the dean of education said, oh my God, we've got to look at our admissions procedure again. Who are these terrible people? It wasn't that. It was that they knew that their ability to do a diagnosis and you know, prescribe you know, a, a third generation uh, um, uh, 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 ACE inhibitor was not going to be useful for them when they went out to try to build systems that were effective. So I think, I think in order to get to the point where we'd be actually helpful uh, to the ambassadors, there has to be a different kind of training program. And I think, and I think it's engineering and not, um, uh, I, I, maybe, let me put it this way, being able to do, uh, you know, a, a line, ass, line probe assay We've never found that to be terribly useful for us in, um, in, in, in the places that we work. But I think this is an exciting potential new area. But before we get there, before, if you were to say to me, oh, we're so excited, we've got money, we're going to send you 15 young doctors from the UCSF, you know, we would just go pale. Right? Uh, uh, because we know that they're not going to come with the kind of skills that will be immediately useful. Um, next. Thank you. Greg Pappas, uh, Chairman of the Department of Community Health Science at the Aga Khan University in, in Karachi, Pakistan. First of all, I want to thank the panel. It was great to hear all these good thoughts. And thank Dr. Glass for uh, making the connection with, with uh, the NIH and, and the fine programs that you help uh, support uh, in uh, our department. Uh, I want to follow up on some of the darker part of the uh, discussion that Dr. Zerhouni um, started for, in my line of thinking. Uh, I live in a city of 18 million people where conditions are deteriorating every, deteriorating every day. Not only the, the, uh, the, the universities, not my department, but the, <laughs> the universities in, in, in Pakistan, uh, the, the sewage system, the, the public health system across the board, uh, conditions are abysmal. Uh, and uh, this is a country, a Pakistan's country that has received billions and billions of dollars in, in foreign assistance over the, many, over, the, over the last many years, much of it in, in, uh, in health, uh, focusing on maternal and child health, and infant mortality has still not gone down. DHS was, uh, was released last year, still hasn't improved in over 10 years. So I challenge this community to take on the tough tasks of looking at where we failed with our foreign assistance. Economists have been doing this. World Bank economists and a whole, whole uh, uh, evolving literature is looking at why aid fails. I haven't seen this community look at why it's failing in the aid, in the aid field. It's something I'm trying to struggle with myself. I've certainly seen it fail on the ground, and uh, I'd just like a comment about how that, that science might go forward. Uh, if I may. Sure. Um, this is a terrific point. I actually um, try to, to understand exactly, for example, I was in Pakistan because of the polio. 
emergence in certain areas. And when you looked into it, it turned out that it was because of deteriorating condition, but also the uh, inacceptability of having male uh, providers uh, coming to the communities. And I had this conversation with uh, the former president, uh, Prowaz Musharraf. He told me the World Bank funded 600 community clinics uh, at, the, at a huge cost in Pakistan. And he said, here's the thing. He said, every time I was on, on maneuvers when he was still in the army, I always put my command post in those community clinics. And I said, Mr. President, I mean, you're taking patients away? He said, no, because they were empty. Nothing was in there because, A, the doctors who were trained did not get trained the way Jim uh, talks about to, to, to be there. And second, because of economic uh, reasons, um, you know, you couldn't really displace doctors from the urban areas to those uh, remote areas, just like we have the same problem here in the United States. So there are issues in, in, in really the operational research aspect of a program where it's so much easier to br build bricks and mortars to X people than it is to truly tackle the problem of local capacity that eventually those uh, nice uh, buildings. There is a disconnect, and I totally agree that there is there is a need to first understand, uh, you know, what is the the platform upon which you put these programs on. And I agree with uh, the ambassador. I don't think we can just import or export um, whatever we know about things on the ground and think that we're doing something that is valuable. It's not the case many times. You need local experience and the ability to grow from the bottom up uh, at some level of scale. Can, 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 yeah, can, so, so Greg and I are from the same tribe, physician, anthropologist. And Greg, I, I think this is a combination of doing some really good GAO type shoe leather work with ethnography. I mean, I think it's an ethnographic problem. Um, I was in an East African country uh, late at night with a group of people from the Ministry of Health of that country. And they had had a few drinks, and they were furious. And they pulled out their laptop computer and showed me a spreadsheet from a malaria program uh, funded by a particular country. And this program uh, was for indoor spraying. Right. And it had, um, uh, they kept saying, we don't know how much overhead they took out in their home country, but once they got here, we're looking at 20 to 30 percent overhead, and they showed me the figure, 57.6 percent for international consultants for an indoor spraying project. Mm -hmm. What are they going to do? Bring people even for Switzerland that say, squeeze the bottle here, squeeze it. <laughs> but that's how it works. Right? So I think there's some truth telling that we've got to do. And I, I don't, some people I think go toward the direction, well, it was structural adjustment versus something else. I don't, I, I think that on the ideological level there are issues. But I think again, you, you, when I, uh, I, I took a colleague of mine, Michael Porter, from the business school to this country and we looked at these books. And he came away saying, this is outrageous. This is the most customer unfriendly industry I've ever seen. How can they possibly get away with this? So I, I think we have to look at this and, and, and that the ethnography will lead us to some, I think, chilling answers as to why it didn't work. Yeah. Can, I, can I just add one thing? First, uh, foreign aid hasn't always failed. The Asian tigers all were recipients of development aid after the war and, and have done very well and have graduated and now aid donors themselves. And I, I think the question is, you can, I don't think you can attribute to the failure of international aid the situation in Pakistan or many other countries with mm -hmm. failure of leadership of, of the, uh, the political culture there of uh, huge problems that go far beyond on aid. I think Jim's point is, is true that the U.S. as the Foreign Assistance Act doesn't put us in the position to do it, but also we've been looking for short-term results out of our aid program. And if the, the USAID talks about a 15-year but every new administration, every new administrator comes in. The Clinton administration was the environmental agency. Then the, the, in Uganda, as soon as when Bush came in, it became we took money away from environment and agriculture and put it in health. And so this idea that we are looking for long-term results doesn't seem to have been our motive. Mm -hmm. Sorry to, I, I see five people to ask questions, and we have about five minutes before the break. So let's be <clears throat> quick questions and quick answers. <laughs> I just have a, a quick take off my clothes. Dr. Kim, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, no one would care one way or the other. <laughs> uh, I'm Bill DeBoggy, and uh, I serve the American people and the world as a humble lobbyist. So <clears throat> I can't, as a lobbyist, sell anything unless it's on one 
piece of paper. And so um, what I'm going to ask you is what they say in these campaigns. What is your message? And be disciplined on that message. And as much as, uh, Dr. Zuhini, as much as I admire you, I don't think you want all those farmers fighting your program. Uh, I've been with the farm lobby and against the farm lobby, and it's better to be with them. So how can we, <laughs> so how can we use that agriculture extension yeah. services to, to prove your point? And a member of Congress or a minister of health in a foreign country would appreciate that, how to use the existing power structure. We're not about changing everything overnight. We're going to be diplomacists. And I would just remind you that your credibility, it seems to me, is the emphasis on science. You are the scientist. But if you're philosophers, if you're politicians, if you're something else, you get away from your credibility. So what you're really selling is that you have a credibility, but it's not a credibility in everything. The, the final thing I'd like to say, the, the Golden 4000, I didn't realize that the Forgate Institute had the Golden 4000. Look what the Greeks did with 300 at Thermopylae, or the, uh, the Biblical 12. Those I'm sure that they must be uh, uh, are somehow integrated in a more complete way. Thank you. Okay. So, science is not optional. It is message number one. Science is absolutely fundamental. And second, without a foundation of people and structures and networks worldwide, everything you built on is going to be fragile. Is that, is that okay for... I understand your message and I can sell it. Okay, sir. <laughs> <laughs> we'll use you, Bill. Next. Yes, uh, good afternoon. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Roberto Trujillo. I am the president of the Pan-American Society of Neurovirology. Uh, first, before I want to congratulate the poverty for the anniversary. And the, uh, my question is on the effective relationship or comment about the developing countries because what I, Dr. Serhoni mentioned is really critical they, they develop the infrastructure the physical infrastructure of the research and the support of each locally in order to be an effective relationship because oftentimes even people train in the United States wonderful training, they go back to their countries and they don't have the laboratories, for example, to develop the local endogenous problems. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes they become administratives and, uh, you know, uh, chairmen of places, but unfortunately, even they lost something during the track. Mm -hmm. So I think one of the emphasis in this. Uh, uh, 15 years I've been working in Latin America is because we need to empower those countries and mm -hmm. we do also have responsibility on the governments to, to emphasize that because the science mm -hmm. at the end of the day is the one who is going to help us and sometimes we discover this in these developing countries personally for example I discovered that last 15 years we follow in the AIDS epidemic in Latin America and we find that some parasites protects to get it HIV. This is a paper we're going to be published on. But if we don't have class infrastructure to start in these countries, <coughs> excuse me, unfortunately it cannot be an effective relationship. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Let me just respond to that, Roberto, because part of what the Fogarty aims to do is both train people, both at home and abroad, build the infrastructure, help with reentry grant to send people back, and twin institutions in the developing world with institutions. So there's a, 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 an equal collaboration that builds the science and, and uh, leads to long-term stability. So I think that's part of what Fogarty does as its, as its mission, and uh, be happy to talk to you about that at the coffee uh, break. I think the Institute of National Institute of Public Health in Mexico is a great example of how visionary efforts to build those kinds of institutions can lead to um, uh, uh, much, uh, much more evidence-based approaches to, to public health. And I think the Public Health Foundation of India is doing the exact same thing right now. So I, I think it's a tried and true model. We just need to do it. Quick, Dan. Hi. Uh, I'm Dan Singer. I work at NIH now. I used to work at CDC. And for four years in between, I was the senior medical policy advisor at State Department. So I know from my time there that everybody speaks with great enthusiasm about global health diplomacy. And we'll have without ever reconciling their completely disparate notions of what global health diplomacy is. And the health people, myself and, and three of the people there, tend to be excited about health diplomacy because they see it as a way to leverage the tools of diplomacy and the tools of national power to advance global health. The, the classic diplomats, and, and Ambassador Coker may be an exception to this, but the classic diplomats see health as a very small part 
of a country's foreign policy priorities. Mm -hmm. And normally, the normal top of the ladder are the national security interests, military security, and economic mm -hmm. security. And they see health as a tool that we can use to build relationships with countries to advance our broad foreign policy interests, of which, again, health is, is only sort of an afterthought. So my question is, amongst all of you, how do you reconcile those two competing interests, which have huge implications for the things that Dr. Kim talked about, about the battle between trade and health, which you know was an issue in 1851, and it's still the primary thing that we fight about within the WHO now? Mm -hmm. I think this is your point. Your <laughs> no, I, I, I'm happy to. I, they, Good. No, I, I, your observation is, is accurate. I am pleased to say that some things that don't work in Washington actually do work better in the field. And part of some of the dilemmas, and we've been in these meetings together at the end, and, and it's some of the dilemmas about what to do at the global level turn out you can never get it right in theory, but you can almost always get it right in practice. And that that, that is, I think, a strength of the U.S. diplomatic system that we don't wait for Washington to decide what's important in an individual relationship. You, you kind of just get on with it. But money talks, we have to match our budget to our priorities. And, and I think in those countries where health spending is a is a big part of U.S. interests, uh, we need we are, are forced to pay attention to that. And some people do it well, and some poorly. Mm -hmm. Maybe we have the last question, uh, Dr. Federoff. Um, two comments. One, I I'm delighted to hear what I'm listening to, but sometimes it seems to me like it's building from the second floor up. Um, health uh, rests on food, mm -hmm. adequate nutrition, and this uh, an international agricultural research system, the CGIAR system, it has a budget of half a billion for the entire world. Comment number one. Comment number two is much more specific to um, the comments that were made about Pakistan. We have, with Pakistan, a very tiny collaborative research program through a, a collaboration between physicians of North American physicians of Pakistani descent and some of the uh, hospitals in Pakistan, um, there is a project developed to supply cell phones, internet enabled cell phones, to lady healthcare workers mm -hmm. in villages. That's investing in people and asking people who know the situation on the ground to solve the problems. I think that is, is a huge lesson. Okay. Mm -hmm. so, so just to get back to Dan's question, which I think is a great one, and to, to, to uh, get at this issue, you know, at, at Partners in Health, we've always included nutrition as part of our intervention. You, you know, we, we feel that you can't um, uh, you know, possibly do uh, treatment for tuberculosis and HIV, which are consumptive diseases without nutritional support. But this was not something that was supported by most funders, right? Now, but to get to Dan's point, you know, uh, if you think about about health and diplomacy, you know, what happened to change the rule um, around um, the, 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 the that changed the um, uh, position of the uh, you know, of the of uh, Carla Hill, the international trade representative, around the issue of whether or not South Africa should or could uh, issue a compulsory license for HIV drugs in May 10th of 2000. Um, I, you know, I don't, I don't know if this is true, but my own sense of it is that um, the AIDS activists started showing up at Al Gore's uh, uh, presidential uh, uh, rallies and held signs up that said Gore kills. And the reason is because Al Gore had gone with the drug industry to try to uh, get the South African government, Nelson Mandela, because the 39 drug companies had sued Nelson Mandela, great public relations move as always. Uh, and, and Gore had actually gone there in, in, uh, for them. And so the very small group of activists started showing up at his rallies, and he was so upset about this, we, we, we hear, that in, on May 10th, President uh, uh, Clinton issued an order that said that around the issue of protecting intellectual property, we also have to take public health considerations into account, like in Sub-Saharan Africa. 
Now, is that's what is that's what what's needed in order to break through some of these problems that we have with the food subsidies? Do we need to take a page out of the undiplomatic um, uh, uh, work of some of the activists who know that in fact there are things that need to be changed, but probably a little bit of undiplomatic activity is going to be needed before we, we we do the right thing? I'm not sure, but again, I think I think that we never should go back from from understanding that these that that, that people who have skin in the game, and in this case it was people who are living with HIV, um, uh, uh, along with other people of goodwill, have changed policy in ways that are pretty stunning. With, with that wonderful comment, <clears throat> we'll end this discussion of global health diplomacy and global health lack of diplomacy. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll be back. We'll reconvene in about 15 minutes right here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Your comments, you're, you're a real, you're a real.